welcome to Gurdum Podcast. Here we will share and talk about the recent trends in the telematics industry, chat with hardware and software manufacturers about the products and updates, and invite Whalen partners to share their best selling practices and experiences in interview to Gurdum's top management for the company's direction. Hello guys, my name is Soren and I'm a technical consultant for Gurdum in North America, a leading global telematics and IoT software provider. I have been working with Gurdum and Wayland for many years and with my own company and became part of Gurdum team last year to help our partners in the US and Canada with their technical questions on Wayland. Today is episode four and we're talking with one of our software developing partners about what business opportunities and solutions they see from their point of view as their main source of business actually comes from creating new solutions or even improving already existing ones. Today we have our special guest, the CEO of Golden M, one of our current 18 software developing partners. They've developed Alpha as the current flagship app for software integrations, and they are currently hosting over 90 custom IoT projects that we can't list here due to various NDAs. So are you guys working from home today? Yes, sir. How are you, Soren? I'm doing pretty good, man. How about yourself? Okay, okay. Well, working from home since the last couple of months, but well, almost two months now. I, I think I lost track of time now. Yeah, no, uh, definitely same. Sometimes, you know, I, I have to go open up the windows just to remember what it's like outside. <laughs> you know, I, um, I have felt this, this routine. Um, I always wake up early, like 6 in the morning, but now I'm waking up at 5 in the morning. So what I'm doing is that I go to my balcony and uh, I, I have got to like the, the fresh air that comes in during the morning because Panama is a very hot place. So at that time... 5, 6, 7 a.m., there's a fresh breeze there, and uh, I've come to enjoy it. It's like walking out or being outdoors somehow. Get, get that little glimpse, <laughs> little yeah. glimpse of heaven right before the day just burns you up. Yeah, right. that's how it is. So, um, so let's just kind of dive into the questions. Could you tell us what your main focus is as a company? Yeah, of course. Um, so Golden M is an IoT software design and development company. And uh, we focus our solutions in business intelligence and operations technology applications. Since I founded Golden M back in 2015, the company has been in constant evolution. We have done everything. We started distributing um, Wyland to a partner here in Panama. Um, but then everything started to progress. And I think we have now developed a very particular skill set for this particular segment. Okay. And so, it, you know, of those skill sets and of those projects, you know, how are, how are some of your current projects coming along? Good. I can't complain. I mean, we don't escape the planet's reality, of course. Um, but, it, but for us, it, it's just a matter of perspective and perception. So for me, perspective in this case is how you look at things, the different angles of this situation. Um, if you think of this as a short-term situation, mid-term situation, long-term situation, and of course, how do you understand your market and, and those timeframes? And then you have perception. Um, that is what you think or know you think about or, or know you know about uh, the current subject and how it shapes your opinion on it. So in our case, we're working as social, but with a you know, the situation has reshaped uh, our vision and mindset on how and what we are doing. So you guys are kind of prioritizing your time and, you know, reorganizing to make sure that, you know, it's not wasted. You know, we're not, we're not focusing on the downsets, right? We're, we're pushing through and deciding what is good to focus on. Yes. I mean, when, when situations like this um, appear, you have to see where you're standing, right? So in regards of third-party projects, we were still working with them. Um, some projects have slowed down, of course, but we have been receiving an, an, a stream of new opportunities that, that, you know, they look promising, they look good, they're moving forward. So in, in our opinion, the market is changing and uh, you need to be able to adapt to it. And regarding what you mean and what you say about time, um, we have changed the way we spend our time internally. And I think that has helped us a lot. It has increased our productivity a lot. 
Okay, so you're talking about a new stream of, you know, opportunities that are coming in. What are the, some of the projects that, you know, you're most proud of or do you think could be of assistance in a time where, you know, we're seeing a lot of these businesses, um, you know, experience a slowdown? Um, well, you see, there's a project we deployed a couple of years ago for a pharmaceutical logistics company in Beirut. I'm sure that given COVID situation, the solution is proved to be essential for their operations. So essentially what it does is that it locks the, the, the temperature sensor the, uh, um, when the unit is carrying medicines, when it has an active or active orders, um, while providing details of the delivery process. Um, the driver has their own app to assist them with the order list, routing, and proof of delivery. So this application is allowing this company to closely monitor their logistics without the need of a big round man operation because this platform allows them to control the process remotely, right? So beyond the mobile app and uh, beyond the real-time tracking and the sensor tracing and everything, um, this the key component is that the orders are assigned automatically throughout a variety of software integrations between this particular solution and the end customer's third-party systems. And so what we do is that we receive the orders, we arrange them, we get the addresses, and we assign them to the vehicles. And uh, that takes a lot of time. So kind of, you know, a lot of these, you know, these new applications, they're not only are they custom designed, but they're, they're really designed for these essential markets where, you know, that are thriving currently, whereas others are, are dropping off. Um, they, you know, I, I can see yeah. that being a real assistance to, you know, those trying to focus on, you know, where to sell right now, because as much people that are dropping off, there's a whole other category of people that are really experiencing a boom right now. Yeah, actually, there's there's one pure IoT solution that we're building, we're the finishing, developing for for an Argentinian company, and it's related to the agriculture industry. So they developed the sensors to to monitor the crops, and we built a UI and the entire communication um, from the device to well, actually, a space, a space based project, and we do we take the data and we build a custom. Um, monitoring solution for them. Um, so yeah, I guess that their investment is paying off and uh, just kind of solutions are giving these companies an operational edge for sure. Gotcha. So, you know, kind of in your line of work, you, you get to see things from an overview um, in all the different kinds of industries, you know, from your perspective, where do you see businesses really thriving currently? Um, well, I think that's an easy one. Um, anything and everything that allows a remote operation. Um, as you can tell by my past examples or my previous examples, um, those two are software solutions that save time and allow uh, remote monitoring of their particular operations, right? So I don't think you have to be in a position like yours or mine, this industry, to realize that business, businesses are thriving right now or surviving are the ones that can connect people with their needs with reduced or no human interaction. And don't think necessarily about those needs as simply getting something, but allowing people to do their jobs remotely. So in this case, Amazon could probably be one of the best examples out there. So first, we have, we have several components here. So the first one are buyers. They don't have to go anywhere to get what they want. They go online, they order it, and then sellers where, where they get their, their, their products from, they don't have to touch their inventory or have physical source to sell it. They just send it to Amazon. Amazon takes you know, control of that inventory and, and they deliver it, they distribute it. So how does Amazon does that? Well, they have their warehouses and they are able to operate because they have managed to automate everything they have able to do. Um, so I think that's a, a good idea of why Amazon is thriving, right? You don't need to do anything or talk to anyone to get your stuff. And internally, they can continue to operate because they have like the same philosophy. So they don't need to have a bunch of people working on their orders and have a crowded warehouse. So in my opinion, there's a pattern for this 
Um, and it would be like, think about factories, warehouses, stores that could leverage IoT to reduce reliance on human resources. Okay. Uh, yeah, for, for example, look, I was reading the news earlier, and uh, think about the entertainment industry. Think about, about movie theaters. That industry won't disappear, but probably it will be reshaped. Something will happen. And you know what the news was about? I was reading that out of auto cinemas, the drive-in cinemas. Yeah. They're starting to, to appear again. So really? some industries, yeah, yeah. So you could, you could accomplish social isolation by simply having, you know, this driving movie theater have an app so they could order um, their candy and everything and then have someone just put it right on, the, on your door. You don't have to have contact with anyone. You watch your movie, you get your candy, and then you go with it, right? So, I mean, this is, this is probably a very basic, simple example, but I think it, it serves the purpose. No, definitely. And that's a big surprise to see, you know, the a practice that's slowly been weeding out for, you know, over the past couple of decades, actually making a return. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, I know for my generation, it's, you know, a drive-in movie theater is like one of the ideal dates. So it's good to see <laughs> making a comeback. Well, I never had that opportunity either. <laughs> so it, in, in this time of economical slowdown, what industries would you focus on, you know, for an M2 in business? Um, I would say deliveries and people, right? So we were talking about industries before. And for example, we, we mentioned about, um, about reducing reliance on human resources. And those jobs won't be lost forever. They will reappear in other industries like, for example, delivery, logistics, transportation, or remote operation monitoring, right? Mm -hmm. So think about getting things to people. Right, okay. and enabling people to do their jobs without minimum human interaction. I, I say that once again, because talking about industries specifically is a tricky thing. Because as the example from the movie uh, theaters before, um, sometimes this this kind of situation proves to be a tremendous opportunity for disrupting technology, or for in this case, old technology or old processes to come back to life, right, and reshape industries again. So. And in our case, in our case, because I can only talk for ourselves, mm -hmm. um, we're focusing on a horizontal niche that serves across industry instead of focusing on just one um, particular industry. So we're all about remote operations and uh, automating um, processes. That's that's easy to understand. So you know, working working the broad spectrum and seeing what the little tasks that can be automated across all systems, you know, instead of uh, you know going down the vertical of you know this app design for you know these three companies. Of course. Okay. So you know, do you think it, it, not everybody has time for this, right? Um, I think now we have a little bit more time, but, and I think a lot of people, you know, especially the smaller guys are a little bit concerned, but it, do you think implementing additional solutions is a feasible idea for smaller businesses? Um, yeah, of course. It's always a good time to implement new solutions. And uh, I don't think even the question is is complete, probably, because I don't think it's, it's only feasible. I think it's necessary and it will be, careless not to use this time to prepare for the future. So you see, this is one of the questions and concerns we often deal with. So the main reason companies don't bet on new solution is first time and the second is money. However, the truth is that Googling, inquiring about a product, uh, scheduling a presentation, or signing up for a free trial doesn't cost any money. And to be honest, uh, to be honest there are many software as a service solutions that have pay as you need or pay as go models, or they don't even require a very hefty or or high initial investment. So it's it's no excuse, and now people have time on their hands. Yeah, we all have a lot more time on our hands right now. If everybody took some of the spare time and you know worked on perfecting their craft or you know perfecting their practice or learning something new, it 
it, there's no doubt that it would help anybody. Um, so it, w in this situation, what measures did your company take to overcome the tough time that we've been having? Um, well, for us, this all started about maybe by the last days of February, mm -hmm. and uh, we noticed how it was expanding, and uh, we decided to be cautious. So we limited um, unnecessary expenses, and uh, we actually had Expo Soledad, which was going to take place last week. Um, of course, it got canceled, Expo Sur in Mexico. And uh, because all of this started, we simply decided not to finish booking the hotel, finish booking the, the tickets, and uh, spending much more on that particular uh, project. And what we did was we simply decided to refocus um, that budget on research and development. Because as I've been saying throughout the entire uh, podcast or interview, um, I mean, we need to prepare for the future for what's to come. So what did work well for you in your business and, you know, what was the useless or even harmful, uh, you know, kind of looking at these processes? <laughs> well, we could be all day here missing things that, that haven't worked out. But I guess good things we have done is keep trying, you know? We, so being serious, flexibility, and persistence have to be a couple of things that, that have worked wonders for us, right? Um, we don't have a rigid mindset. We're open to questions and criticism. And the reason behind this is that we're constantly building something new, and new things are usually hard to, to plan, right? You, you, you know, you, you don't know for sure what to expect until it simply happens. So we need to have a, an open mind. And uh, that being said, we do have failed. Who hasn't, right? Yeah. And, uh, but truth is that we always strive to deliver, no matter the circumstances, the circumstances or challenges that it might pose, right? But I don't know, a, a harmful thing that, that we have done I don't know, that's, that's pretty strong. Um, we have taken, or I have taken decisions that are going to be wrong or detrimental to, to our objectives, but some of them have taught us valuable lessons that have proven essential to our growth. So, I don't know, good luck, good luck, you never know. I think that's a really good perspective to have on it. You know, calling something harmful is only harmful if you do it again. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Of course, I, I think I, I think everybody has the chance to fail, and uh, I mean, it wasn't Edison that said that that he found ten thousand ways not to build a, a, a blue line, right? Yeah. I <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so in the have you guys learned anything from the COVID nineteen situation? If so, you know, could you share your insights with us? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think everybody has, right? Um, and in my case, it has added to my crisis handling skill repository. I'm a 28-year-old Venezuelan, and uh, I've been formally working since I was almost 18 years old back in 2009, right? So 10 years ago. Crisis is my natural environment. So my first job was, yeah. That, I mean, that was my, a little bit dark. That was... No, no. Okay, so my <laughs> professional life has been in, in a crisis environment. Yeah. Um, so let me let me explain this, right? So my first job was in the financial industry, right? Back in 2009, if you remember about a decade ago, financial markets crashed and uh, Venezuela wasn't um, isolated from that. Yeah. Um, even though the problem was internal, the government decided it was a good time to crack down on, on uh, the financial system. And well, there were a bunch of internal Venezuelan complications that we weren't allowed to buy um, uh, foreign currency freely and you have some quotas and stuff. So, so this the financial sector, financial industry was an outlet for that. So the government decided to crack down on that one. So I ended up um, selling blackberries um, and repairing them, and I, I started selling them online. Right. Okay, so, so we're talking about the phone. Yeah, <laughs> I the phone. yeah, I the phone. Look, and I was on the same company. And in parallel, I decided I was 
back in 2009, I, I finished high school. I was starting my economics degree. And, uh, well, I met um, a couple of guys in, in my university. Um, they became my business partners. And we, um, we decided to start with an uh, import company. So we, we took a chance. Um, to make the story short, we got robbed uh, by, the, <laughs> by the company making the, the delivery from China to, to, it was like our fifth delivery from China to Venezuela. Um, there were some tablets, and we, we had bought like a couple, of, a couple of hundreds of them for Christmas. And uh, the company was owned by this coronel. Uh, um, I don't know, he was a, a, a guy from the armed forces. And uh, I, don't, I don't know, I think they decided to keep that merchandise from those, for themselves. But afterwards, we, we insisted, and um, we, <laughs> we decided to launch a convenience store chain. That was about 2012. So in 2000, that was in 2012, yeah. So next year, 2013, the Venezuelan government, again, decided it was a good idea to intervene the, the industry I was working on and uh, regulated prices, yeah, for several things, uh, several items on the, on the retail industry. And, uh, well, we had, we had planned like seven stores by the end of 2014, and we ended up with three. We were still growing. We were still moving, it was still moving forward. And we continued to grow, uh, more restrictions, more, more challenges, no merchandise. You know what, what happened the first days of the COVID situation, the U.S., where there was no toilet paper? Yeah. And everybody was in crisis? Well, basically, empty shelves have been the norm in Venezuela since probably 2012, 2013. So I left Venezuela early 2016, right? So in, in the middle, in between those years, I even, um, I, I knew how to handle black markets to get food you needed. If not, you died um, because supermarkets didn't, didn't have um, the supplies you needed and so on. So circling back and not, not to extend myself, as you can tell, crisis has been around my business life um, or my work life a lot throughout my entire decade working, right? Mm -hmm. So so then I moved here, it was a new country. Um, I mean, I couldn't sell anything back in Venezuela, so I moved here to Panama with my savings. And uh, well, Golden M, I had, I had started Golden M um, like six, nine months before, and well, I took the shot and moved here to Panama to give Golden M a shot, and here we are. Wow. So, yeah, for me, the most important lesson would be that if it happens to others, it can happen to you. We all saw the warnings, we still do, and they still choose to believe something different, right? Mm -hmm. So, in my opinion, or my conclusion with this would be like that living is a decision. You can choose to form an opinion based on facts or hopes. But truth is, is that there's a very big difference between the probability of something happening and hoping for something to happen. And the, the ones that choose to base their opinions on facts have at least a chance to shape the future. And, and that doesn't mean that you cannot hope for something. But as, as you guys say, you know, um, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. They're, they're different things, right? Totally. It's a, it's a very philosophical moment we just had on here. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have like six weeks or two months. I don't know how long stuck in here. I have had <laughs> It's stuck with your own <laughs> thoughts, just on the path of existentialism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I guess, you know, it, talking about, you know, opinions and, you know, how you view things, uh, what have you guys changed in your business, um, you know, after COVID and, you know, what do you think, uh, uh, how do you think those things will stick around? Oh, okay. So for us, the change has already begun. And uh, I think 
I don't know if the COVID situation, I, I really don't think that the COVID situation will be forever. Someday we'll find a vaccine and uh, things probably will start to get better. But we don't know when will that happen, right? So what we do know is that it will take some time, right? So, so for us, it's what I was saying about hoping some, for something and, and believing something or, or knowing something, right? The only thing that we know is that it will take some time. So we are reshaping our business model and R&D efforts or research and development efforts to what we understand will be the new market dynamics. So I guess uh, beginning of this podcast, you said, you know, a hey, we have a list of new opportunities that are incoming due to the current situation. Uh, do you have any examples of those that you can talk about? If we, we talk, we have talked about enabling people, right? Yeah. So I think we need to start, I think the opportunities and what we were mentioning before about our horizontal niche, this can be said differently, right? Mm-hmm. So for us, what we're doing actually is enabling companies. Or what we want to do is to enable companies that don't have um, the skills or the infrastructure to operate remotely, whatever that means to them, being being that enabling them to uh, make online sales and manage their delivery, uh, being that you know, tracking sensor data from their operations in a warehouse or in a remote location, being that tracking their sales team um, activity on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Being that whatever that is, right? Yeah. Monitoring a remote worker, um, using technology to reduce distance, I don't know, whatever that is, but I think enabling companies to adapt quickly to this new reality is the best opportunity that, that has been, at least for the people working in the telematic or actually IoT industry, yeah. right? Because as, the, as the, the, the letters actually stand for, it's the internet of things. We need, if we can operate things or monitor things remotely, the only thing to the only way to enable that is through the internet, and that's the industry we serve, right? We within the telematic industry, that's that's what we do. Yeah. So in this case, we're not even really talking about you know opportunities, you know, knocking like, hey, hey I need this developed. Like I have an idea. It's just it, more of the general opportunity of, you know, it, it where this this automation could have always been but now is detrimental to people's businesses uh, because it no lo- it doesn't exist in the first place because no one focused on it. No one. Yeah. And obviously, obviously there will be some, some situations where people simply think about an idea and mm-hmm. knock on your door and say, Hey, I have this idea. I want to do this. Right. So I think that's a good time to at least entertain those ideas, right? Something yeah. good might come might come out of it, but I think that those ideas usually will be serving or enabling someone or something to do an activity or a task or anything remotely. Yeah. Or with reduced human interaction, which for me is the same thing. I you know, I, I really I, I totally agree. Okay, guys, I guess we're going to wrap it up for episode four. Thank you, Orlando, for your time and expertise, and I hope you guys can learn more about how software integrations can enhance your business and bring you a competitive advantage. I hope you got a couple ideas on how to use this time of crisis as a time for opportunity, time to change, and time to try new things and adjust your business based on the new reality that we have in front of us. Here at Gertham, we're ready to help you with all of it. We hope to see you all on the next episode. Please stay safe, and please... Please stay home.